So I, I appreciate the, the plug from, from Paul as we get started. Um, you know, I for those that haven't been on before when I've presented, I, I'm thankful I, I've been able to do a few on the forum and get to know each of you. I am sorry for not being on more often. Uh, two kids are more than one, and it has uh, doubled a lot of responsibility at home, and there's a lot of church activities that go on for us, and so I, I'm not able to get on as, as much as I'd like, but I, I have loved the presentations. I think so highly of so many that have presented on the forum and, you know, work from people like Brian Stubbs and others that uh, Jerry Grover, I know Eric Turner's on tonight and his work on geography in the Book of Mormon. I just think there's so many wonderful things that we do and it's good to gather together and have a community where we can present different materials that the Lord's inspired us with and I'm thankful to be with you tonight. So I'm, I'm Josh Gailey. I am an evangelist of the Church of Jesus Christ. Our headquarters is in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, and we're a small church with an international footprint uh, all around the world in, in, you know, all different continents and continuing to grow. And we're a restoration church that if you look through, trace our history through Sidney Rigdon and then to William Bickerton and on to today. So when we trace our lineage back to the angel that flew through the midst of heaven, that's how we do that. And I um, was blessed to work over the last five or six years on a book that has just been released this year. If anybody enjoys the material tonight, actually several of you have bought the book, have reached out to me personally, so there's a lot of support on the forum already, which is wonderful, but the book is Witnessing Miracles. If anything that's spoken tonight strikes you and you want more information, the book is not a difficult read, but is it, it has a lot of great resources and direct quotes relevant to the witnesses regarding the Book of, Mor regarding the book of Mormon and overlaying that research with some of the apologetic work for the resurrection of Jesus, which is something I've presented here in the past. And so we're going to deep dive a little bit tonight on the witnesses. Maybe there's many things you've seen before. Hopefully there's a quote or two or some research in here that maybe you haven't seen before. And I hope that that might be the takeaway. But if you do go to Amazon, if you want to check it out in more detail, the, my shameless plug to get started. If you go to Amazon and you just type in witnessing miracles, it'll come up and you can, uh, you can access that for yourself. Uh, some Paul has graciously allowed me to, to post some of the videos that of different presentations I've done before. So I do have a website at book of Mormon history.com. It's, it's private. It's my own. I, I run a podcast called the book of Mormon history podcast. You can access that on any forum, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And if not, and you still want to listen to some of that material where I'm interviewing different researchers and their, their work on different uh, historical aspects of the Book of Mormon, you can access that at, at bookofmormonhistory.com. And my passion for that is I do have a degree in archaeology, and it's not what I do professionally anymore, but it, it's why I love the the historical aspects of the book. And so bookofmormonhistories.com is a resource for anybody that would be interested as well. And as I've spoken in, you know, Paul referenced in the past, I've been blessed to be on here. This is actually my fourth night. I, I, I was surprised looking back, but we've done the comparison of the apologetic evidence for the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus and overlaying that with the restoration of the gospel and coming forth of the Book of Mormon. That's some original research that I've done. And then another bit of original resource, uh, original research that I've done and been able to present on before is a deep dive into the hermeneutics of 3rd Nephi 27, when Christ says, this is my gospel, and overlaying that with uh, and Roger's on tonight. He has done some similar work as well and was able to present previously. But in 3rd Nephi 27, I then overlaid that with different gospel statements in the New Testament, especially those that might even predate some of the letters and the gospels themselves. And we find that the messages match. The message of the gospel that Christ gives in Bountiful in his own words matches those of the apostles in the, in the New Testament. And so we looked at that and also the geography uh, of 
how would you even begin to map the Book of Mormon? And I gave, there's a hundred different approaches to that. I gave my opinion on having a datum point and working from a, a known center and building out from there. Um, tonight, what we're going to be doing is, you know, the book itself, I'll do just a little summary here and then dive into a lot of the different quotes, wonderful quotes from the witnesses for the Book of Mormon and the Golden Plates. But I'm taking in the book what's called a minimal facts approach. And what that is, is you're trying to figure out, okay, something happened in the past. What are the bare bone basics that both a critical scholar and somebody like me that would be a believing scholar? So on one side of the equation, you might have a, someone like a Bowman or someone like a Dan Vogel. And on as maybe unbelievers or skeptics on you know my side, uh, a believing side, I would be somebody that's a believer in the Book of Mormon. But what are some of the minimal facts we could both agree on? And then using a historical method to determine what's the best explanation of those facts. So it's, it's a way, it's the historical method that I use to approach the witnesses and come up to a conclusion that I sincerely believe the best explanation of the facts is that the Book of Mormon did come from golden plates that were extracted out of a hill in New York. We'll look at a little bit of that, but we'll be more focused on the witnesses tonight. But this is the, the method, the standard. So if somebody wants to do their own research and come to a different conclusion, they can, as long as we have the same starting point. And this is the starting point. I was amazed when I started doing this research, how many, now I began to realize how many biographies I'd read, how many different things I'd read that had no basis in a historical method. It was just the opinion of the author. And this is an attempt to kind of strip that away. And I simplify that in the book. So here's some of the, the conclusions of the book that I draw as I work my way through the, the text. And it's a short book. It's less than 200 pages, so it's not a hard read. But some of the main points of the book are the fact that the Book of Mormon is impactful. This is chapter one of the book. It's impactful. It has impacted millions of people. Of course, as a believer, I wish that impact was even greater but it has been tremendously impactful and it's worthy of investigation into the miraculous origins of how it began and how it came to be. There should be an explanation of how it came into existence. Um, there is ample source materials available to complete the investigation. So maybe we could look at, at a miracle from history. Uh, somebody could say, well, you know, I had a dream last night and that could come from the Lord, but it, it may not be something we could test in history. You know, personal experiences are certain. So many events, not even miracles, but so many events in history are obscure. And you can never actually prove or disprove them or bring forth evidence to support them. But when it comes to the Book of Mormon, there's tons of source materials. We'll be looking at them. There's tons of source materials to actually do the investigation and trying to decide, well, what actually happened here? There's way more materials than would ever be available for something from deep antiquity. So many times, like the, the Roman historian Livy, you know, it, only like 38 out of 100 different books that he wrote even exist today or even available today. So much gets lost to history. So we have plenty of original source materials from the witnesses and those who were around the witnesses and from Joseph Smith and those who were around Joseph Smith to do an investigation to see what actually might have happened. His neighbors, his enemies, they wrote. Lorenzo Saunders, there's so many that we can look at that, that wrote, not even all the friendly ones, but they're available to lay out there and do the investigation. So we have, we have way more source materials. Uh, the resurrection of Christ and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, they're comparable miracles for testing using the same historical method. Both of them started a religious movement, both added to the religious canon of their day, the New Testament. The apostles boldly wrote their letters and Peter in, in Peter 3.16 writes about the letters of Paul and he calls them the word of God. And so they were authoritatively writing just as this new religious movement with the, resur with the restoration comes forth and all of a sudden, we have a new scriptural text 
there's there's a comparison there. Now that correlation might not necessarily mean causation. That's what we need to look into. But at least there's a correlation there, something worth investigating. Um, so uh, one side point to that is for the Book of Mormon to be true, to have any source of reality, to be a living miracle today, Christ has to have resurrected. So the resurrection of Christ is a, is a prerequisite because in 3 Nephi, we see the Lord descending at Temple Bountiful and appearing to 2,500 people, including women and children. And so I would argue that with that, with the Lord's descent to Bountiful, if the Book of Mormon is true, the Book of Mormon is actually the greatest evidence in support for the resurrection ever offered to mankind. So just somebody that believes in Jesus, but doesn't even want to touch the restoration movement, doesn't even want to look at the Book of Mormon. Well, actually, within the Book of Mormon, there's a great hope of Christ resurrecting and it being an independent witness of the risen Savior from thousands of miles away. That should propel even a skeptic who's a believer in Christ to pursue the miracle and pursue this line of evidence. So we do have multiple witnesses that claim to see or handle the golden plates that Joseph Smith procured out of a hill just a few miles from his house and just a few miles from Palmyra, New York. Um, we have, of course, the three witnesses. They claim in two groups of two to, uh, it starts off, Joseph's with both of them, but it starts off with all four of them, uh, David, Oliver, Martin, and Joseph, and they're all together praying, and Martin believes he's the reason why they're not seeking the revelation, so he goes off on his own, and Martin, David, and Joseph behold the angel who presents the plates and other artifacts, and they hear a voice that declares unto them that the translation is correct. And then you have Joseph going to find Martin, and they pray together, and it's just those two, and they see the angel, and he's holding the plates, and Martin cries out, tis enough, tis enough, mine eyes have beheld. And so that's our three witnesses. That's what happens on that, as Oliver describes, Oliver Cowdery described it on that clear, beautiful morning, okay, uh, when they were able to witness the plates. And even Lucy Smith remembered when Joseph came home, the relief he had that he wasn't alone anymore. He told his mother, he says, I'm not alone in the world. Others will have to bear record of this thing. And so she, the way Joseph's mom described it, I thought so powerful because she saw the relief of her son as he's coming in, basically saying, <laughs> he didn't say it in so many words, but mom, I'm, I'm not a lunatic. Others have seen this. I'm not alone in the world, you know, and, uh, and they'll have to bear record. Later, there's, according to John Whitmer's account, the eight witnesses, when they see it, it's in two groups of four plus Joseph. So you have five and five. Uh, so we have four sets of independent groups seeing the plates and the eight witnesses, it's very tangible. Joseph hands them to them. They turn the pages, they view the engravings, and we'll get into some of their accounts. So when we just see the three and the eight, I think it's mistaken for us to just say, well, it's, it's the group of three and it's the group of eight. Well, it's, it's actually a group of three, Joseph, David, and Martin. Then it's a group of two, or uh, David, Joseph, and Oliver. Then it's a group of two, Martin and Joseph. Then it's a group of five and another group of five for the eight witnesses. And you also, you have to include Joseph Smith Jr. and his accounts. And there are others as well that we'll look at. Um, we have uh, the witnesses remain true to their testimony. And this was really a previous presentation, so we won't go into this in as much detail, but the witnesses remain true to their testimony, even though they're excommunicated from the church that they found, even though they faced financial hardship, they are robbed, they are beaten, they are threatened, and they, of course, in the case of Joseph and Hiram, they die. And someone might say, well, you know, well, they maybe 
when Joseph and Sidney Rigdon were stripped from their homes in Kirtland and tarred and feathered with 140 degree boiling, you know, boiling pine tar. And Joseph clenches his teeth so tight that they don't shove the tar into his mouth so that he would die. Okay, you know, you could argue that that was over some land right disputes and over some of the financial hardships happening in Kirtland. And I'd say that's true. But at the same time, the only reason that those disputes were happening was because there was a church in existence. And there was a church in existence only because there was a Book of Mormon procured out of a hill. It's the founding miracle to a religious movement. At any point in time, all these hardships and robberies could have stopped. All the opposition could have stopped. They just, they just had to reject their testimony. But the issue is they didn't die or suffer for a belief. Okay, martyrs, martyrs die for beliefs all the time. And a martyr could die for a false belief. Okay, when, when you know, terrorists take a plane and fly it into the World Trade Center, they do it because they firmly believe in something but it doesn't necessarily make it true. So people die for beliefs all the time, but the witnesses in the New Testament and the witnesses in the Book of Mormon, they're in a different category than belief. They're not suffering and dying for belief. They're, they're suffering and dying for their eyewitness knowledge. They knew what they had seen for themselves. That's a different, that's a different look than just dying for something that you believe in. Point six that you'll see in the book, there's historical evidence for the empty stone box. It doesn't just stop with the golden plates. Joseph procures the golden plates out of a hill and out of an empty stone box. That's a presentation I've done here previously. And there's a hole in the ground from which the plates were procured. And I, I present the evidence for that as equal or stronger than the evidence for the empty tomb. So if you believe in the evidence for the empty tomb to be well supported, which I certainly do, as presented by William Lane Craig, Craig, Michael Lacona, other apologists for the resurrection, if they're willing to look at the evidence, it's equal or stronger for the restoration. And so ultimately then to conclude that, if the best evident explanation of the facts is that Jesus rose from the tomb, my conclusion in the book is that a his, the same historian must conclude that the Book of Mormon is also a mir miracle using the minimal facts approach of inference to the best explanation. So uh, I don't stop there with the book. I do the comparison of the gospel message, and I do it also using uh, uh, looking at the pervasive message of the gospel given throughout the Book of Mormon and um, also laying out some of the Hebraisms that are in the Book of Mormon text that are identifying and highlighting different aspects of the gospel message. And I, I find it to be beautiful. And uh, so the last point that I make is, is similar to many apologists for Christ, and it's that you can know for yourself. Well, all the evidence is good. It's entertaining. I think we'll enjoy it tonight. But at the same time, you can go to the Lord yourself. He can personally reveal his truth to you. And I have in the last chapter of the book a number of experiences of miracles where somebody has asked the Lord about the truth of the Book of Mormon, and through vision or through dream or through healing, God has specifically and explicitly answered the, those prayers. And we believe in a living Christ and a living God who's able to reveal himself to mankind. And so that's the conclusion of the book is, is all the inductive arguments can be put to the side, and you can actually know for yourself. You don't need any of those to inform your faith. God can reveal himself to you. So when we lay out the book, well, how do we get a fact from the book? Well, we look at five different points of evidence. You have early testimonies or preferred to later testimonies. This is going to sound like a courtroom, and it's true. When you're trying to figure out what happens in history, sometimes it is a little bit like trying to figure out what actually happened at a scene of a crime, okay? Embarrassing admissions, all right? If if two teams play in a football game and the losing coach compliments the quarterback play of the winning team, and he says, oh, they have a great quarterback, man, he beat us tonight. Odds are that embarrassing admission by the losing coach is true. Probably is true that the, the winning quarterback, you know, stripped through that ball tight and, and made some first downs and threw some touchdown passes. If, if a coach embarrassingly admits that on the losing side and compliments an opposing player, 
probably means that that happened. So early testimonies are preferred to later, embarrassing admissions. Eyewitness testimony is of course pre preferred to secondary. Doesn't mean that you throw out secondary testimonies. They can be accurate, but eyewitness testimony is of course preferred. And you have, if testimonies of enemies should be used, and you, if you have multiple independent sources testifying to the same event, that helps support the cause as well. So when we're trying to figure out on a minimal facts approach of what happened, and you look at uh, you look at each of these factors of how to figure out what happened, this is how we lay out some simple facts. And we have many witnesses. We went into the 11 and Joseph. You also have multiple women, Catherine Salisbury, which was Catherine Smith. You have Emma Smith. You have Josiah Stoll and Isaac Hale. We're going to look at those. And you have some enemies as well that publish many, many more sources. It's it's a myth to say, hey, in the beginning of my Book of Mormon, I have the testimony of the three and the testimony of the eight, and that's it. No, no, no. David Whitmer gave 70 interviews, 70 throughout his lifetime that we have that are extant. So for the three witnesses, you have close, not quite, you have like 238 or something. You have almost 250 sources from them them telling their neighbor, them speaking, them writing a letter, them giving an interview of what actually happened. When you have the eight witnesses, a lot of them die a lot earlier. They don't live as long or you know, they get disenfranchised pretty early, but overall you still have over 60, not quite 70, but you have over 60 different accounts from them. Not just two or three. We have many, many, many independent sources to do this investigation. So laying all that aside, let's take a moment and appreciate the witnesses for what they say. I'll, I'll read a couple of examples. I'm gonna be reading from each one. I wanna personalize it because this is a real human being speaking to somebody else and giving his testimony on what he believed he saw for himself. You know, Martin at one point, and I'm gonna crack open the book a little bit and be, uh, be giving some, some fuller quotes than what you see. Sometimes you're limited on PowerPoint with how much you want to type before people can get lost in the words. But, you know, one time a group of men tried to get Martin Harris drunk to figure out the truth of what happened in the Book of Mormon. Now, Martin swore that he, he didn't drink, okay, that he was just taking sips while everybody else was chugging, all right? Whether that's true or whether he was smashed, I, you know, I, I can't tell you that historically, but what I can tell you is, is his answer. And that night when he was supposedly liquored up, um, he boldly affirmed he did not reject in the height of that, that moment. He says, gentlemen, what I have said is true from the fact that my belief is swallowed up in knowledge. Here's that he understood that his testimony was different than just a belief. He goes, what I have said is true from the, from the fact that my belief is swallowed up in knowledge. For I want to say to you as the Lord lives, I do know that I stood with the prophet Joseph Smith in the presence of an angel. I'll give another quote from him. He says, now a different time, there was a group basically asking him to reject. He says, you know, how can you possibly believe this? And he says, no, I, I don't believe anything about it. Knowledge supersedes belief. I know it is true. I saw the angel and saw the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated and heard the voice of God declare it was translated correctly. So let me give one that I, I didn't put on the screen tonight. This is just another little moment from Martin. You know, early on, the plates are very active and there's very little translating happening because early on, other treasure hunters in the area were trying to steal the plates. And so they're moving around, they're getting shuffled around the Cooper shop across the streets, getting busted up and torn up. And people are pounding at the hearth in the room and uh, trying to bribe different ones. People are trying to, the, the initial reaction from the community is not that Joseph's a fool. He never found anything in his life. That's, that's not the reaction from Palmyra 
at the beginning. Not at all. The reaction is multiple people actively engaged in coups trying to steal the plates. And at one point, they have to flee to uh, from Palmyra, New York, to where Joseph's in-laws were in Harmony, Pennsylvania, for peace, for a little relief, and for protection, because there were threats of, if he doesn't give it up, we're going to, and there was a lot of threats going on. So Martin is with Joseph packing up. They hide the plates wrapped in a frock. They hide it in a barrel. And even though the, the wagon gets searched on the way out, they don't dig through the barrel to find the fact that they buried it in the barrel. But Martin at this time, during this time when they're hiding the plates, he says, Martin says, did I not at one time hold the plates on my knee for an hour and a half whilst in conversation with Joseph when we went to bury them in the woods that the enemy might not obtain them? Yes, I did. And as many of the plates as Joseph Smith translated, I handled with my hands, plate after plate. So a, a wonderful quote from Martin that's just one of many that he gives throughout his life. Oliver, I'm going to focus on just for a minute here because he actually gives the fewest. He dies the earliest and is disenfranchised and, and away from any restoration church for a while. He practices law for a significant length of time. You know, Oliver said, I'm a dying man. What would it profit for me to tell you a lie? I, and so this is at the end of his life, even though he died pretty young says, I know that the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God. My eyes saw, my ears heard, and I know whereof I testified as true. It was no dream, no vain imagination of the mind. It was real. And we have multiple different accounts of, of Oliver. Uh, shortly after I, I published the book, I had a gentleman reach out to me and ask about one of the controversial statements of Oliver. So I'm going to take a moment and because I will say things in the book and I will say things in an interview or I'll say things on a recording like this and say, the witnesses never recanted. And I had somebody write in and say, well, what about some of these controversial quotes? And Oliver dies in the 50s. And there are two controversial quotes attributed to Oliver 30 years later in the 1880s. And so Somebody wrote to me and said, can you give me some explanation of how you would say Oliver never recanted when uh, on the Book of Mormon when there's two controversial quotes? Now, one of them is disregarded by believer and unbeliever alike. And the second one is not taken. Uh, well, let, let me address this and show you perspective. I think for each reference, each source, I try and weigh it in with the same historical method, historical method across the book and try and be as impartial as I can. There's a testimony of Oliver testifying to the Book of Mormon in a courtroom. And to me, that evidence is not strong enough for me to include in the book. So I didn't. I find this line of reasoning equal on the opposite side as maybe a contrary source. David and Martin live long enough, they refute every false publication about them. David hears of a false report. He stands up and publishes an interview and says, that's not what I said. I said this. Let me correct the record. You know, and they defend themselves. Well, Oliver's dead for 30 years before this controversial source comes out. He can't defend himself. So what's the pro for Oliver never recanting? The pro that he always remained true to his testimony. Well, we have a corpus of letters, early accounts, him writing about accounts that we have, and it's always supportive of the Book of Mormon. We have his earliest account in November of 1829 of him referring to his early experiences and his witness. He writes, and others remember retellings of his accounts throughout the 1830s. These are multiply attested early source documents, and there's nothing dating to his lifetime that would suggest otherwise. We have early retellings from non-sympathetic sources that he was true to his testimony. This includes a, a Painesville Telegraph, a newspaper in Ohio, reporting about his positive witness of the Book of Mormon, even though it was not a positively affiliated uh, publication. And he's the one that writes the first copy of the witness statement on the printer's manuscript. 
So he certainly knew what the original was and whether or not his signature was there. So after his excommunication, there's multiple witnesses that support him remaining strong in his statement. So Oliver's wife makes strong statements. At his death, Oliver is multiple people at Oliver's death are there, they're present, and they report that basically his dying words is to profess his witness of the Book of Mormon. And uh, there's multiple, there's a statement from 1846 on that and 1848 recording and reporting what was happening at the time. So this is all multiply attested, given throughout his life. And we have early statements, we have direct statements, we have statements from enemies confirming it. So when we look at how do we decide a fact, all those things check off all those boxes, okay, that Oliver was pro Book of Mormon and never recanted. Now, when we start looking at the one statement that is maybe taken seriously by some, but not, not weighed in this way, is there's a statement from a Mr. Keene, because Oliver later after he's excommunicated does join the Methodist church for a time. And the controversy when he joins the Methodist church is his relationship with the Restoration Movement and Book of Mormon. And so the there's a statement from a Mr. Keene basically saying that there was a board discussing Oliver's membership and whether or not he needed to recant in order to be a member of the church. And again, this is given 30 years after the fact, but the Mr. Keene who gives this account admits that Oliver did join the Methodist church, which is true. And, and he was the account says from this Mr. Keene that he was willing to give up Mormonism. All right, so you know the question is, well, what did that mean? In the same account from Mr. Keene, it says that Oliver rejected to a recantation. Okay, so on one hand, it's saying Oliver is willing to give up Mormonism. On the other hand, he was unwilling to recant. Okay, and he requ Oliver specifically requested to the board that if he did recant, that it would be publicly published. And of course, nothing was ever published or made public. And Mr. Keene admits that he did not ever actually recant. And so my conclusion of that, when I weigh it all in the historical method that I use, is that Oliver was willing, because he's willing to join the Methodist church, he was certainly willing to give up the church that he had founded at the time and what it had turned into. And I think that that's probably true. That may be true, that if he was going to be forced to recant, he would have carefully worded a recantation, disassociating himself from the church movement that he started. But the reason, why would he be so specific in wanting a published account, making it published and public? He wanted it to be known what he was not recanting, because nowhere in that text or in that account from Mr. Keene was Oliver willing to recant on the Book of Mormon. And so Oliver remained true to the Book of Mormon throughout his life. And even on this source that some critic might use on the internet, if they actually weigh it in with the historical method, you might come to some conclusions about how Oliver felt about the church at the time, but you're not going to come to a, a conclusion about how he felt about the Book of Mormon that's different than all the other accounts that we have. He certainly remained true to it throughout his life. So we cannot cherry pick statements away from the historical record. If they're possible disconfirming, we need to weigh that appropriately. And when we do, what we find is Oliver's testimony throughout his life for the Book of Mormon and the Golden Plates stands true and valid. Okay, I'm going to just be brief on David Whitmer because I do want to hit a few of the eight witnesses and enjoy some of that time. But David Whitmer has a great quote here that I'll, I'll pull up and I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. David says, I've been visited by thousands of people believers and unbelievers, men and ladies of all degrees, sometimes as many in 15 in one day, as 15 in one day, and have never failed in my testimony. And they will know someday that my testimony is true. I heard the voice of the angel, just as stated in the said book, and the engravings on the plates were shown to us. 
and we were commanded to bear record of them. And if they are not true, then there is no truth. And if there is no truth, there is no God. If there is no God, then there is no existence. But there is a God, and I know it. I love that example given to us by David Whitmer. I just find it powerful. I find it a little bold, and I, I like it. I like the way that he, he draws the line on truth. And I know Paul did a, a question of truth with a capital T or a lowercase t for for David Whitmer, the Book of Mormon was, was a representation of truth with a capital T that day, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, John Whitmer, his brother, and at one point a historian in the early church, is one of our eight witnesses. And he has a wonderful quote. So I'll, I'll read a quote from one of our eight witnesses, John Whitmer. John says, it may not be amiss in this place to give a statement that the Book of Mormon is a revelation from God. I have no hesitancy, but with all confidence have signed my name to it as such. Therefore, I desire to testify to all that I have most assuredly seen the plates from whence the Book of Mormon is translated, and that I have handled these plates and know of a surety that Joseph Smith Jr., has translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. And in this thing, the wisdom of the wise most assuredly has perished. Therefore, know ye, O inhabitants of the earth, wherever this address may come, that I have in this thing freed my garments of your blood, whether you believe or disbelieve the statements of your unworthy friend and well-wisher. A powerful, strong affirmation from John Whitmer, one of the eight. Now, Joseph Smith Sr. is not maybe considered a martyr per se, but he did die very early in the movement. And he dies because of part of the, when the excommunication order happens by Governor Boggs and they're moving out and Hiram and Joseph are in Liberty Jail and they're imprisoned. Joseph Smith Sr. gets sick and dies. That tied into that time period. So he certainly was a casualty of the persecution in some degree. And there's even earlier a powerful moment. And Paul referenced this when we were writing about maybe having me do the presentation. And uh, Paul said, well, make sure, make sure this one's in there. And I, I definitely wanted to include it because some of these are not as popular. They're not out there as, as much, but they are powerful. They might not be popular, but they are powerful. You know, Samuel, in the early beginnings, the Book of Mormon's printed, um, and it's in the fall of 1830, a debt collector comes to the house of Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy and is collecting on a $14 debt. And Joseph Sr. offers the man $6 immediately. So he offers over a third, not quite half of the debt right up front and, and offers to pay that and continue making his payments to pay it off as hard as he can. He's refused by the debt collector and for not paying the whole thing. And he petitions Joseph Smith Sr. to throw his books of Mormon that are on the shelf into the fire. And if he does that, that the debt will immediately be forgiven. Uh, Joseph Smith Sr. refuses to do that. He will not burn what was to him the word of God and a, a revelation from the Lord. And so his refusal, he is imprisoned in a, in a debtor arrangement. And here's a quote from when his son Samuel Smith went to visit him. He says, immediately after I left your mother, the men by whom I was taken commenced using every possible argument to induce me to renounce the Book of Mormon, saying, how much better it would be for you to deny that silly thing than to be disgraced and imprisoned when you might not only escape this, but also have the note back, as well as the money which you have paid on it. To this I made no reply. They still went on in the same manner till we arrived at the jail, when they gurried me into this dismal dungeon. 
I shuddered when I first heard these heavy doors creaking upon their hinges. But then I thought to myself, I was not the first man who had been imprisoned for the truth's sake. And when I should meet Paul in the paradise of God, I could tell him that I too had been in the bonds for the gospel which he had preached. And this has been my, this has been my only consolation. From the time I entered until now, and this time fourth day, I have had nothing to eat save a pint basin full of very weak broth, and there lies the basin yet. A quote from Joseph Smith Sr. as he speaks to his son while he was imprisoned there in the fall of 1830. Very early persecution there. Uh, Hiram Page was beaten for his testimony of the Book of Mormon and never recanted during that, that uh, difficult beating. And a great quote for him what is, uh, as to the Book of Mormon, it would be doing an injustice to myself. He's writing here to William McClellan, an early apostle of the church who later leaves, you know, is later excommunicated from the church. But he's writing to William McClellan. William McClellan stays true to the Book of Mormon as well, even though he was never a witness. His quote is from Hiram. As to the Book of Mormon, it would be doing an injustice to myself and to the work of God of the last days to say that I could know a thing to be true in 1830 and know the same thing to be false in 1847. To say my mind was so treacherous that I had forgotten what I saw, it would be treating the God of heaven with contempt to deny these testimonies. And Hiram was never excommunicated. All the other eight witnesses and three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, if their last name was not Smith, except for Hiram Page, they were all excommunicated from the church. Hiram just leaves. He's not formally excommunicated, but all the others were excommunicated, but never, while there might have been inner turmoil happening there, they never reject the Book of Mormon. Hiram Smith, Joseph's brother, gives a great quote out of Liberty Jail. So I'll, I'll read that quote to you. I, I hope each one is encouraging to you. It, it certainly is to me. Um, but when they were in prison in Missouri, Hiram writes a letter to the church to encourage the church members who are, are fleeing out of, out of Missouri. It says, having given my testimony to the world of the truth of the Book of Mormon, and having been brought into great affliction and distress for the same, I thought that it might be strengthening to my beloved brethren to give them a short account of my sufferings for the truth's sake. I had been abused and thrust into a dungeon and confined for months on account of my faith and the, quote, testimony of Jesus Christ, end quote. However, I thank God that I felt a determination to die rather than deny the things which my eyes had seen, which my hands had handled which I had borne testimony to, wherever my lot had been cast, and I can assure my beloved brethren that I was enabled to bear as strong a testimony when nothing but death presented itself as ever I did in my life. You know, the, the dire straits that was the Liberty Prison at the time were extreme, but Hiram's consolation was actually hanging on to the truth which he had seen for himself and bearing that to the saints. I think it's important to note that it's not just the three and the eight that are witnesses to the plates. The women were in the house. They cleaned the house. They're around the farm. They certainly, while maybe not seeing the plates uncovered, we're seeing an artifact that looked exactly like the plates underneath the frock. They were seeing the frock covering it and feeling it and even moving it. And we have different testimonies of that from Emma and Catherine. And one testimony of that from Lucy through a secondhand source. But Catherine's is multiply attested by her, uh, her um, I believe it's her children actually that give the testimony but different ones give it and it here's the quote that she told her son while dusting up the room where the prophet had his study she saw a package on the table containing the gold plates 
on which was engraved the story of the Book of Mormon. She said she hefted those plates and found them to be very heavy, like gold, and also rippled her fingers up the edge of the plates and felt that they were separate metal plates and heard the tinkle of the sound that they made. That is a very tangible, physical interaction with the gold plates. She might not have used her sense of, of sight per se, except to see the frock and the dimensions of the plates, but she is feeling them and, it's a t and holding them. There's a physical interaction here with a very real artifact. You know, one thing people will mention would be that like when it comes to the early apostles, there are people that will mention the fact that the early converts, people like Clement, who's mentioned in the New Testament, actually, in Philippians, but people like Clement, who were with Paul, people like others that were with Peter, they write down testimonies that the apostles had testified to them that they had seen the resurrection. And a lot of people use that as evidence for the resurrection itself. I want to give one such comparable evidence for the golden plates through the apostle William McClellan. Okay. He, he has a, a, a moment when there's actually a $80 reward, which would be worth about 2,500 bucks today to turn in any eyewitness of the Book of Mormon. If you turned in an eyewitness of the Book of Mormon, you were immediately going to make 25, the equivalent of $2,500. So um, he, uh, in this moment, William is with Oliver and, and David, and all of their lives are in danger. And here's the quote from William McClellan. In 1833, when mobbing reigned triumphant in Jackson County, Missouri, I and Oliver Cowdery fled from our homes for fear of personal violence on Saturday, the 20th day of July. The mob dispersed, agreeing to meet again on the next Tuesday. They offered $80 reward for anyone who would deliver Cowdery or McClellan in Independence on Tuesday. On Monday, I slipped down into the Whitmer settlement, and there in the lonely woods, I met with David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. I said to them, quote, brethren, I have never seen an open vision in my life, but you men say you have, and therefore you positively know. Now you know that our lives are in danger every hour, if the mob can only catch us. Tell me in the fear of God, is that Book of Mormon true? End quote. Cowdery looked at me with uh, some solemnity depicted in his face and said, brother William, God sent his holy angel to declare the truth of the translation of it to us, and therefore we know. And though the mob kill us, yet we must die declaring its truth. David said, Oliver has told you the solemn truth, for we could not be deceived. I most truly declare to you its truth. Just like Clement in the early church, William McClellan for this early church gives us an account of eyewitnesses telling him the truth of what they saw. So much so throughout this man's life, even though he dies in his 80s, unaffiliated with any Restoration Church, he believed in the Book of Mormon. That's how powerfully the eyewitness testimonies impacted him. He re eventually rejects the church. He has problems with church leadership. What he does not give up is the Book of Mormon. That's how this man who was converted by Hiram Smith and later has this moment with William and all of, uh, with David Whitmer and Oliver, that's how powerfully William was impacted by their testimonies. Uh, the quote here is uh, given at the end of his life on the board. It says, I've set my, to my seal that the Book of Mormon is a true divine record, and it will require more evidence than I've ever seen to shake me relative to its purity. When a man goes at the Book of Mormon, he touches the apple of my eye. He fights against truth, against purity, against light, against the purest or one of the truest, purest books on earth. Fight the wrongs of LDSism as much as you please, but let that unique, that inimitable book alone. So we also have... 
Sorry, Paul. Will you give me a couple more minutes, even though I'm I'm on my time limit here? Not, no, you can't have it to more than another hour. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have unlikely testimonies as well. Uh, Isaac Hale is the father-in-law of, of Joseph Smith. He does not approve of his son-in-law. He can't stand treasure hunting. He wants his son-in-law to give that up. Joseph promises to give that up to him. And then just a couple of months later, claims to have golden plates out of a hill. And Isaac is not impressed at all. He, uh, when Joseph comes seeking um, peaceful, you know, seeking some refuge in harmony, Isaac says, you, you can't stay at this house until you show me the golden plates for myself. And Joseph tells him, well, you can't do that, but they're in this box. You can hold it, heft it, shake it, anything you want. And so here's a quote from a letter from Isaac Hale that on its own would just fall into obscurity of the historical record. But when you add it to everything else, you begin to realize there is a real artifact floating around here that needs to be accounted for. Isaac says, quote, I was allowed to feel the weight of the box, and they gave me to understand that the book of plates was then in the box, into which, however, I was not allowed to look. Another evidence for a real artifact that he's hefting and handling. It's stuff like this that makes the strongest critic admit that there's some sort of plates here. You know, the strongest critics will agree with my minimal facts because of just how powerful these evidences are. You have Josiah Stoll testifying under oath in court of law. Here's somebody that paid Joseph every month to treasure hunt, and his family thought Josiah was being scammed. They took Joseph to court because they thought he was being scammed. And yet, in this moment, Josiah testifies at court, something that shocked Joseph and everybody else in the courtroom. And here's a quote with... Uh, from Josiah, quote, witness, which is reference, this is the, the court uh, typeset, witness, meaning Josiah, was at Palmyra and saw a prisoner, Joseph Smith Jr. That prisoner told witness that the Lord told prisoner that a golden Bible was in certain hill, that Smith, the prisoner, went in the night and brought the Bible, as Smith said. Witness, hear, hear this. Witness saw a corner of it. So what this is saying is Josiah was home at the Smiths the night that Joseph brought in the plates. Joseph got the plates out of the hill, hid them in a hollowed log on the hill for a while, and then eventually brings them home. The night he brings them home, Josiah is at the house. Jose uh, Joseph Smith passes the plates through the window. When he passes the plates through the window, prisoner was, uh, was there the night and witness saw a corner of it. It resembled a stone and should judge it to have been about one foot square, six inches thick. He would not let it be seen by anyone. The Lord commanded him not. It was unknown to Smith that the witness saw a corner of the Bible. The leaves were gold. There were written characters on the leaves. And so the greenish cast from the stone might be the flickering firelight or something like that. But here's a, a remarkable witness of the golden plates. Another theory is it might be the binding on some of the plates, maybe a copper binding that was uh, a greenish cast, but he describes the plates as being gold and even describes the fact that they had engravings. The unlikeliest of testimony, this one was only recovered within the last 15 years. And yet here's a new account available to us through the court records. One more I'll give, there's, there's others in the book, it is from an enemy, okay, testifying to the fact that there really was a hole in the ground dug exactly when Joseph said it was dug, which would have been 1823. Lorenzo Saunders was a fellow money digger with Joseph. He later turns to be an enemy because he wants a share of the profits because golden plates would be valuable. And Lorenzo wants them sold and he wants his money. And so Lorenzo, decades and decades later, writes some letters which slander the Smiths, discredit everything, say not, he never found a thing. But then he gives this interesting quote. 
and he explains, so Lorenzo claims to have visited the hill within a few weeks, within weeks of Joseph procuring the plates out of the hill. And he claims to do that in 1827. And I'll quote, he did it with, quote, five or six other ones. And we hunted the side of the hill by course and could not find no place where the ground had been broke. There was a large hole dug a year or two before, but no fresh dirt. I looked for a lot of historians to see if they caught the significance of this. I couldn't find anything. The significance of this to me is Joseph claims to do the excavation and expose the stone box in 1823. He might have loosely covered up everything, but the actual excavation happens in 1823. Lorenzo Saunders remarkably admits that within weeks of 1827, he goes to the hill and what does he find? He finds a hole in the ground that had been dug just a few years before. Well, the hole would have been dug just a few years before in 1823. Remarkably, this is a testimony from an enemy written to slander the Smiths that actually bear a testimony of the truth of the location of the hole being exactly where Joseph said it was, of the fact that there was a hole exactly where Joseph said it was, and the timing of when the hole was excavated. And even though Lorenzo thought it wasn't when Joseph claimed it was, it actually was exactly when Joseph claimed it was. And so here we have an unlikely testimony. All of these things compile and compact together when we look at the data. The data is consistent. You have witnesses. Seven different witnesses are just described the color of the plates as gold or golden or having the appearance of gold. One even said it was a copper gold mix. You have eight different witnesses that in their different accounts and describe the engravings on the plates. By the way, if you want much more detail on this, Jerry Grover, who's presented on here as an excellent book, Ziff, I think he did that presentation. There's some parts of that presentation that's right here. In this. Two of the different witnesses give the black patina stain description that the engravings were somehow covered with a, you know, maybe an acid treatment to create a black patina so you could see the engraving on the plates. You have 11 different ones describing the plate thickness. You have seven different accounts talking about them being bound. The plates were bound by three rings shaped in like a reverse D. That's why you see all those pictures of the plates. They're pretty consistent because we have so many details. Five different accounts talk about the sealed portion on the plates. The weights vary, but are within a reasonable range of 40 to 60 pounds for a, a copper uh, gold combination of Tumbaga or something similar. And you have a, a general description of the plates being about seven by eight inches by six by seven by six by eight. So now these witnesses aren't all saying everything word for word. But the beauty is like a courtroom, if witnesses stand up in a courtroom and give everything word for word, the exact same thing, no change, no variation, cops and lawyers will cringe and say, oh, these people have collaborated. What you look for for testimonies is consistency with, all, with personal interpretation and variation within the consistency. And that's what you get when you look at the color, gold, golden, having the appearance of gold a combination of copper. They're not saying the exact same thing, but they're clearly describing the exact same artifact. The weight, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 60 pounds. Well, clearly heavy <laughs> and clearly within about the same range and also the dimensions. So you see a lot of consistency within the data without copying of the testimony. So when you, again, you look at, well, what are the facts from all this? I propose four facts that I believe that whether you're a believing scholar or, or not, that all the evidence would support these four facts. Fact number one, multiple people sincerely believe they saw and or held the golden plates and additional artifacts. I think that that would be undisputed. You could not say there was nothing there that people sincerely believe that they saw and or held this this artifact that even if you disagree with my conclusion 
I think that, that this fact is a true fact of history. Another fact, multiple people sincerely believed there was an empty stone box and hole in the ground on a hill near Palmyra, New York. Even enemies agree to this. So I think it's a, a well-confirmed historical fact. Point number three, and I've gotten into some of those in more detail in other presentations and certainly do in the book. Joseph Smith Jr. had something of comparable weight and size as the purported golden plates during the time he claimed to have them. I, even Dan Vogel, Fawn Brody, a critical biographer, would agree to that minimal fact. And the fact that Joseph Smith Jr. produced the Book of Mormon, which was printed in Palmyra, New York. We might dispute how he produced it, but the Book of Mormon exists today. It is an undisputed fact. We need to account for it. Now, with all those witnesses and all that evidence, what's the best explanation of the facts? I sincerely believe the best explanation of the facts on historical grounds is that not on spiritual grounds, on historical grounds, is that Joseph Smith Jr. received golden plates and translated the Book of Mormon by supernatural means. This offers the best explanatory scope, okay? So what that means is it, it, it accounts, explanatory scope and explanatory power. It accounts for the most data, the most, the highest quantity of data and sources, and it best explains the data. So it's quality and quantity of the sources. Well, my conclusion best accounts for the quality and quantity and quality. It's the best in explanatory scope and power. I don't think that could be debated. It's the most plausible if you believe Jesus resurrected and you're willing to grant that God can perform a miracle. There's no implausibility as long as you grant those premises. It's the least ad hoc. There are other ad hoc conclusions. Some people might say, well, Joseph, he made a set of tin plates. Well, that's very ad hoc because nobody said Joseph had tin plates. That's not how they described the plates. And you have, you're fighting against every witness statement of the historical record when you do that. So my explanation is very much so the least ad hoc. Fake plates or forged plates by Joseph with no evidence to support it, at least direct evidence. You got to create some, some conspiracy there that it's the very definition of ad hoc. And even if you're a critic coming up with that, you would have to admit that. You'd have to say, yeah, this is ad hoc, but it's the best I've got. You know, and there's no contradictions or disconfirming data from my conclusion. So my conclusion that this is a miracle from history, it best explains why the Book of Mormon exists, why it could be produced in as few as 65 working days. It best explains why we have multiple independent witnesses sharing similar accounts of the translation process of the Book of Mormon by the dictation of Joseph Smith Jr. We didn't even get into that. It's the best explanation of why Joseph Smith Jr. and Frontier Farmers produced a book believed to be scripture by several different churches today. It's the best explanation of why the Book of Mormon text makes extraordinary claims about itself as divinely inspired scripture. It's the best explanation of why the Book of Mormon text makes extraordinary claims about Jesus Christ being the risen son of God. It's the best explanation for why three witnesses would sign an affidavit that they saw the plates and an angel that they claim to hear a voice confirming the truth of the translation of the text. And I, I can go on and on here. I'll just pick a couple more. It's the best explanation for why Josiah Stoll would testify under oath that he saw the golden plates. The best explanation is he did. Uh, it's the best explanation for why the restoration movement begins. It's the best explanation of why enemies try to steal an artifact from the financially destitute Smiths because of the artifact's presumed financial value. All the enemies knew the poor, how poor the Smiths were. And yet, a miracle is the best explanation of why they would think otherwise. It's the most plausible. If God exists, then an inspired Book of Mormon is, is certainly plausible. The only caveat here is God exists and he raised Jesus from the dead. 
The Book of Mormon, reason why it's plausible? Well, the Book of Mormon makes miraculous claims about its own contents. Its contents profess the resurrection of Christ. Participants during the time of its creation all share the miraculous accounts of its coming forth. Emma, Oliver, and others surrounded with the translation. It's plausible as inspired scripture. It serves to divine, it serves as a divine confirmation of these radical claims. So if the resurrection is plausible, the miraculous Book of Mormon is, is equally plausible. And the Book of Mormon actually increases the plausibility of the resurrection as it records additional witnesses of Jesus Christ alive after his crucifixion. It is not ad hoc. Two additional hypotheses are necessary for it not to be ad hoc. Number one, God exists. And number two, that Jesus was raised from the dead. If, if we grant those two premises, the Book of Mormon being a miracle is, is not ad hoc in the historical record. If you're not willing to grant those, then you would call it ad hoc. And there would be no disconfirming or contradictions. It's in accord with accepted beliefs. If, the historical, if there is a historical resurrection of Christ included in the Book of Miracle, it's demonstrated by multiple scholars then as it, it's not contradictory. And, um, and it would be, you know, there would be a contradiction if we were saying Joseph Smith naturally translated the plates. That's not the claim. The claim is that it was a, a supernatural event. So with that, there would be not a, a contradiction. Now, here's some scholars. Speaking of the resurrection, you know, Behan McCullough says that Jesus being raised from the dead is of greater explanatory scope and power than any other hypotheses which try to account for the relevant evidence. William Lane Craig's, Craig, speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, says it far outstrips all other explanations of the facts. Historian Michael Lacona, Lacona, Lacona concludes the resurrection of Jesus was very certain. Well, if all those things are true, I would argue that the Book of Mormon is certainly the best explanation of the facts if we're willing to grant the resurrection. And I believe that we should value the eyewitnesses that we have and celebrate the sources that they left us. I hope that this book, it's, it's not too long, it's not too hard to read. I hope that this book would be valuable for anybody that would value the witnesses. Just like Richard Lloyd Anderson's book is wonderful on the witnesses, and I, I believe every believer in the Book of Mormon should have that text as well. I hope that in some small way, this might contribute in support of, of their witness and, and make them real and tangible and something that we can interact with even today. So I, I hope that you've enjoyed a, a, a tour across the witnesses and some of my conclusions I draw from re by reading them. So...